a 1990s titty flash. Julia Stiles flashes her <laughs> soccer coach in detention, obviously to help Patrick sneak out, but yeah. could have waited a half hour for him to get out of detention. It can't be that long of a detention. Can you imagine flashing your teacher? <laughs> the things that go on in this high school. The guidance counselor is writing erotica. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And for you lovers out there, we're going to cover one of our all-time favorite romantic comedies. From 1999, we'll be covering 10 Things I Hate About You in this episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. And I got to say, on a rewatch, 10 Things I Hate About You is one of those rare teen romantic comedies that has aged pretty well. It has. There are some jokes that haven't aged that well. But I will say... There is a significant difference between the first half of the movie and the second half of the movie. Explain. The second half of the movie is excellent. The first half is still really good, mm -hmm. but I think the movie really starts to take off once Heath Ledger's character comes into play. So Patrick Verona, once he's really part of the plot, then it really soars to great levels. New heights. New heights. And there's also things in the first act that you never really see, like Alison Janney's character has like a big scene with in the opening with uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and then you see her like twice after that. The pervy yeah, guidance the, counselor. Uh, yeah, he who's was, writing like, smut. Yeah, <laughs> writing smut. And you think that's going to be like a pretty steady th uh, thorough line, and then she just is gone. <laughs> I think there's some deleted scenes with her in it. It must be, because th Alison Janney's a great actor, and I, I totally forgot she was in it. And then it's her scene. I was like, oh, my God, Alison Janney's in this? That's pretty crazy. ridiculous. And I really enjoyed it, but I was also kind of shocked that the, the swings they were taking with this movie back in 1999, they were just fearless with this film. And it came out in 1999, the greatest year in the history of cinema, no dispute, directed by Gil Younger, written by Karen McCullough and Kirsten Smith. It's a 7.3 on IMDb with 378,000 reviews. Damn. Rotten Tomatoes, 10 Things I Hate About You, is a 73% critic score, 70% audience score. On Letterboxd, it is a 4.0, ladies and gentlemen, with 243,000 ratings. It's a lot. For a movie that has hasn't that has not come out in the last five years. It's a rarity. That's a lot of ratings. I noticed that there was this trend the last year. Let's tell us about it, man. <laughs> <laughs> As I was like analyzing the numbers of Letterboxd, I kept noticing that 10 Things I Hate About You kept cropping up in the most watched popular page. Yeah. Every time I went on Letterboxd for, for months, the past several months. And, I, and then I just, I was looking at the numbers just growing, growing, growing. And like in the last year, it's gotten like 200,000 five-star ratings. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at it, it's got like 350,000 five-star ratings. So it just blew up with the younger generation of girls. Well, I mean, that's kind of just a, a freaking shot in the dark right there. You're just making an ambiguous statement there. I mean, have you seen... Well, you don't know what film girl Twitter is up to. You don't know what film boy Twitter is up to. Why I can't see, boys... No, no, no. Why can't Look boys at the reviews. Watch, why have, can't boys watch 10 Things I Hate About You? Because I've seen the reviews. And okay. It's all... Did you count them? <laughs> male to female? Oh, my God. I'm going to... Just saying. I'm going to destroy you. Anthony loves to jump to conclusions, everybody. <laughs> Apparently, no boy has ever watched 10 That's Things I Hate About You. That's not what I said. According to Anthony. That's not all what I said. It's only girls watch I did not movie. say that. I, I, I love this movie. And I was also curious when Oppenheimer come out, came out, uh, Twitter was going nuts for Crumultz in it. And, <laughs> and I was like, young people know who David Crumultz is? And it's because of this movie. True. He's awesome in this movie. He really carries the first He's half. Funny. On a budget of $30 million, 10 Things I Hate About You grossed $53 million at the global box office. But it was also a massive hit with VHS and then eventually DVD sales. This was a regular at Blockbuster that had multiple DVDs or VHSs. Oh, yeah, you know, you, 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 you could tell it was a good movie with how many... On displays. Did there. you did you take a photo of this? Can I see evidence of this? No, I remember. <laughs> no, I remember. Yeah, the I have blockbuster ten things I remember I hate about you display. I remember it was everything. Just packed. It was a whole wall. No, not a whole wall, but there's always several. Tom, Mission Impossible two and ten things I hate about you. That's there how you always can get at blockbuster. Several. Well, plus the new releases are always packed, bro. Half the shelf, baby. But ten things I hate about you usually had at least ten ready to go. <laughs> oh man, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot for a movie that just, you know, came out in 1999. I mean, most movies did have just one pile, yeah. one row, with yeah. like four DVDs behind it. Depends on the popularity. Action oh, yeah. movies were pretty popping. Oh, yeah. But the cast of this movie is great. Obviously, Heath Ledger and Julie Stiles led the film. Joseph Gordon-Levitt in a really great role. It's funny seeing him so young because you know his mannerisms so well and to see him as like a 19-year-old, it's wild. He plays 
No, well, he's 16, 17. No, in real life, I mean. Oh, is he 19 in the movie? He did this, like, while he was in college. Oh. Yeah, he just looks so young. His name is Cameron James in the film, which is a play on the director, James Cameron's name. Hey! Fun fact. Nice. Fun fact, nice. man. Gabriel Union's in this? She's 28 years old when she's in this movie, but wow, she looks really? like a teenager. She looks like one of the youngest, for Age sure. Age like fine wine. And I mean, uh, one of the biggest takeaways for me on the rewatch was just just feeling the the Heath Ledger loss every time he's on screen. Yeah. And even in something like this, like a romantic teen comedy, he does so much with the role. Like, it's just unbelievable seeing him on screen and uh, the mannerisms he made. Uh, if you know this about Joker, Joaquin Phoenix m- mimicked Heath Ledger's dance on the steps when he did the st- steps oh, yeah, in, in Joker. The kick so and everything, yeah. he used that as inspiration because Heath Ledger was his his favorite actor of all time. So that was his homage to Heath Ledger when Joe, when he did the dancing down the steps. You can see the high kicks going up and down. It's very reminiscent of Heath Ledger's marching band song. Did they ever work together? They never worked together. They never worked together? No. I'm sure they were friends. I'm sure they knew I'm each sure other. I'm sure they knew each other, yeah. And uh, ironically... Joseph Gordon-Levitt looks just like Heath Ledger. They have like that yes. same exact smile. It's it's pretty interesting. Have you, yeah, I've seen split screen photos of them, and they just it looks like they're brothers. Really just interesting how hair. much they look alike. And from the forehead down, <laughs> from the forehead down, forehead down. And this movie's actually an adaptation of a William Shakespeare play. Sure is. It's based upon the Taming of the Shrew. Now the Shrew. <laughs> Excuse me. A, a shrew. I'm allergic to William Shakespeare. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the definition of a shrew is an unpleasant, ill-tempered woman characterized by scolding, nagging, and aggression. Also, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> it's a comedic stock character in literature and folklore, both Western and Eastern. And the theme is illustrated clearly in Shakespeare's play, The Taming of the Shrew. And in that play, it's a very similar kind of thing where uh, the daughter of a magistrate won't let her date her wait date her marry <laughs> because of her sister. So then uh, another man, a suitor, is paid to court her, the sister. So it's a very similar plot. I actually have the synopsis. If I, I can read it, it's just a couple paragraphs. Read the fuck out of it, man. Of the Taming of the Shrew from William Shakespeare. So this is a plot summary. If you've never read it, then it's too late. I'm going to spoil it for you. The Taming of the Shrew is a comedy play written by Bill Shakespeare. <laughs> The play centers around the courtship and marriage of Petruchio, a wealthy gentleman, and Katerine, a strong-willed and sharp-tongued daughter of a wealthy merchant. I think I'll name my son Petruchio. <laughs> it's subtle. <laughs> the play opens with a framing device in which a drunken tinker, that's a great word, tinker, named Christopher's Lie is tricked into believing that he is a nobleman. The action that sh- then shifts to the city of Padua, where Petruchio arrives to find a wife. He's drawn to Katerine, who is known for her sharp tongue and strong will. Despite her reputation, Petruchio is determined to marry her, and Catherine, Katerina's father agrees to match in order to be rid of her. Petruchio and Katerine's courtship is marked by verbal sparring and Katerine's resistance to Petruchio's attempts to control her. Petruchio, on the other hand, uses various tactics to tame Katerine, such as denying her food and clothing and manipulating her with compliments and flattery. After their wedding, Petruchio takes Katerine to his home, where he continues his efforts to tame her. Eventually, Katerine is broken and agrees to Petruchio's demands. The play ends with Katerine giving a speech in which she praises the virtues of wifely obedience, which is widely believed to be a final act of irony. In addition to the central story of Petruchio and Katerine, the play also features a subplot in which Petruchio's friend Lucentio falls in love and marries Katerine's sister, Bianca. They have the same plot, like you said, Anthony said. Bianca has to... Or the Katerine has to marry in order for Bianca to get married. And Bianca and Lucien, Lucentio secretly get married, despite the fact that Katerine had to get married first. That so, felt like more than two paragraphs. I said a couple. That felt like 18 paragraphs. Yeah, but wasn't it— I almost fell asleep. Wasn't it, How could you possibly fall asleep when there were words like Tinkerer in there? <laughs> and also my great voice. But I found it very entertaining. <laughs> and— it reminded me very much of 10 Things I Hate About You, which is just an excellent title for a movie, by the way. The irony of the title is when Julia Stiles' cat gives her poem, her, reads her poem in class, it's way more than 10 things she hates about him. It sure it's is. way more. If, I, I was like, counting, I was like, was, like was that 14? <laughs> <laughs> 10 sounds better. Now, during a Q&A with the screenwriters, Karen McCullough revealed where the title came from to quote her. The title is based on a diary entry I made in high school. She explained, I had a boyfriend named Anthony. <laughs> That I was frequently unhappy with. <laughs> I made a list called Things I Hate About Anthony. 
<laughs> is that true? When Kristen Smith and I decided to write this, I went through all of my high school diaries to bone up on the angsty memories. And when I told her about that list, she was like, that's our title. Wait, is it really Anthony in there? I, I swear to God. It turns <laughs> out her ex-boyfriend likes the movie. Anthony is very proud of the fact. McCullough said, we're still friends today. And every now and then, I'll get a random phone call in the middle of the night. My nephew doesn't believe that this title is about me. Tell him. On the phone, I'm like, yes, I hated Anthony in high school. <laughs> it's, oh, it's true. It's 100% true. Why just, would I lie? I, I you're just making fun of me. Why would I lie? <laughs> oh, there's well, it is a coincidence because everyone hates you, man. <laughs> Do you have 10 things you hate about me? Yeah, man. Your fucking face. <laughs> <laughs> it looks too much like mine. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I'm going to kill you, man. <laughs> oh, my God. That took a turn. Did it, though? Shit. Isn't that surprising? <laughs> Actually, no. 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 <laughs> I mean, I know you've killed like three people, so. <laughs> well, it's basically the plot of 10 things I hate about you. So, Julie Styles plays Katarine Cat. Where's the teen uh, drunken house party, though? In what? In Shakespeare's play. I'm fucking right. I don't know, man. I didn't read the whole play out. Can you just look? I was going to explain Thank the God plot. you didn't. People are trying to listen to this. People are trying to listen. <laughs> Anyways, the plot of 10 Things I Hate About You, Julia Stiles plays Kat. Her sister, Bianca, cannot date anyone at school unless Kat dates. Kat, I'm assuming she's a senior, it feels like. She seems like a senior, At yeah. least a junior or senior, and I believe that her sister, Bianca's got to be a sophomore. She is indeed. She's a sophomore, yeah. You got a keen ear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is a silly episode. And Bianca is a popular girl at school. Uh, she's a lot of suitors, specifically Joey, as well as the new kid, Cameron, played by GGL. They all, want to, they all want to date her, but Bianca can't date. She can't go to the prom. She can't do anything like that unless her sister, Kat, goes to the prom. So Joey pays the local bad boy, the charming bad boy, played by Heath Ledger. Verona, Patrick Verona, to date Kat so that he can date Bianca. So very similar to yeah. Taming of the Shrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I love everything about this movie. It hits all the archetypes, but I will say, one of my favorite comedies is Not Another Team Movie. Hundred percent. It it not another team movie is top tier spoof movie. It's like airplane, scary movie, not another team movie. Like they're all in that cat like they're all incredible. And I didn't I never because I haven't seen this movie for so long. I didn't realize that 10 Things I Hate About You was by far the biggest victim of the Not Another Team movie spoof. A hundred percent. So man. much of the- It's that and yeah. Varsity Blues. Yeah, Varsity Blues and the 10 Things I Hate About You, the structures of them, especially with this film, they just took so many so many characters and so many plot points as like, it's like the base of Not Another Team movie. Yeah, well, when was the last time you saw Not Another Team movie? Three, four years ago? I would yeah. say Varsity Blues is just as much a base mm. for that movie. But yeah, yeah they're both like 50-50 it's, it's in it. It's undercoat. So it's basically like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich where... <laughs> so Not Another Team movie is the bread. The peanut butter is probably 10 things I hate about you. The jam, the jelly, whatever, the rhubarb, you, whatever you're using. <laughs> rhubarb. That is... <laughs> Varsity Blues. I like that. It's not bad at all, man. It's not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because, I mean, all the football sequences, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. All the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Chris Evans' character, all that. But, like, as I was watching this movie, especially the first act, it's the setup of... It, it just reminded me of Janie Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone but her. She's got glasses and a ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things about this, like the tropes, the high school movie tropes. Yeah. And I think the biggest one, the first couple of minutes, five minutes of this movie... Is how Joseph Gordon Levitt's the new kid at school. He meets Cameron, who's going to show him around. And they're literally talking about Bianca seven feet away from her <laughs> while she's like walking in slow motion. And then he, the, the camera's going around them. They're literally speaking about her so loud. Yeah. There's no way she's not hearing it, but they make fun of that really well in another team movie when they're walking right past her. And they're like, look at her. She's got glasses <laughs> and a ponytail. And she like walks right past them while they're saying it. The same thing happens in this movie. There's no way Bianca can't hear what they're saying. And I, I love the tour. The, the tour of the clicks that yes. Krumholtz takes them on. Krumholtz is great in this. He, like, really, I think he was, like, the MVP of the first half of the movie, Krumholtz. Absolutely. He's so funny, and he plays, like, that awkward, nerdy guy. But it just, for some reason, JGL first day at school, now they're best friends. <laughs> and he's, like, devoting, he's, Krumholtz is devoting his entire livelihood and all of his time to getting Joseph Gordon-Levitt laid. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Just, it's just part of the plot He's now. like, we got this, man. We can do this. <laughs> <laughs> they do a horrible thing. They, they pay a guy to date yeah. a girl. Or they, Damn. They, 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 he, they don't, but they help. Yeah. They help try to get him to date her. But so I actually love the tour of the cliques in the opening when they're going to the high school. So we have 
the splendid edition of what he goes through. He talks about first the click is the your basic beautiful people. Uh, basically, don't talk to them unless they talk to you first. Don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> the white Rastas, the Rastafarians, which was hysterical because that was huge in the 90s, that kind of look and aesthetic of mm-hmm. you know the Bob Marley crowd. Bob Marley posters, yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. The future MBAs, which are, he says, Yuppie Greed is back, my friend. And then also the Cowboys, the closest thing they've come to a cow is McDonald's. That one was a bit odd for me. Yeah, I don't know that one. <laughs> but then I remember not another. Must be a '90s thing in yeah. high school because we weren't in high school in the '90s. Not another T movie does the same kind of thing. They go through all the clicks mm-hmm. uh, at the first like day of school or something like that. So that was one of my favorite parts of just seeing the clicks because we all had clicks in high school and we all knew them whether you were part of them or not. They're very specific to different types of culture or or whether they're popular or pretty or nerdy or whatever. And there's another scene when Joey's at the lunch table and. And Crumultz goes down to uh, talk to him to come up with a plan. And he's like, w- can I help you? <laughs> Why are you speaking to me? <laughs> it's so funny. Like, the politics of the hierarchy is fantastic in this. Who's your favorite character in this movie? My favorite character is Patrick. Patrick Verona? Yeah. Why? It's Heath Ledger. <laughs> he's so cool. <laughs> I, I, it's He's so cool, but he, he plays nihilistic and apathetic, but he does have a heart. And he does have he just hides it. So there's a lot more. He's a very complex person, but he's, I love his devil may care attitude. I love his nonchalant tone about every, everything. And then I like that he it does connect with someone and then he can't like the first time he spends an like, actual date with Kat, he's like, I can't go forward with this anymore. Like he, tr- he wanted to stop immediately, but then it was Joey's extra money that really made him keep going so the fact that he immediately after connecting with her was like this doesn't feel right for me but 300 dollars makes it feels right sure it does 300 dollars in 1999 is like 500 yeah that's a lot of money it's like a good amount of money especially if you don't have a job what about your favorite character mr morgan (laughs) he's funny english teacher hysterical so goddamn funny and he he makes he roasts cat so many times as well as joey but I love how he he's talking to Cat. One of the first things he says to her is like, "Oh, please tell me about your overcoming your upper class, your upper middle class oppression." <laughs> <laughs> he's like, "Go protest lunch meat or whatever it is you white girls complain about." <laughs> <laughs> so fucking funny. I but I think Mr. Morgan's my favorite character. He's hysterical in this movie. He's someone I've always forget about in the movie, and he's he does steal all the scenes he's in. He's great. Yeah, he's really funny. He's very charming. Very charismatic. And I like how it's. You, I don't, know, I don't know why, but I assume like the the super political activist teenage girl maybe started in the 2010s, but it started earlier than that. Oh, and way Julia, earlier. Julia Stiles' cat is a great example of it for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, this movie has a bunch of tropes. It has that stubborn teen girl, which yeah. is the lead of a lot of high school movies. And I, I love how this movie, you know, written by two women, they're not afraid to critique feminism in the 1990s and like like the feminist club with the feminist band <laughs> and Kat, and Kat's obsession with the feminism. So I think it's really funny how they poke fun at it at the same time. as a lot of irony. It actually contrasted so many romantic comedies and teen comedies where the, if the lead was a girl, she was desperate for the guy yeah exactly try she was trying to get the guy but in this film your lead character doesn't want anyone and so i thought it was a great twist on the genre that hadn't been done like that before the stubborn teen girl is a massive high school trope for sure we have also the charming bad boy patrick verona come on that's a trope for sure the sweet young romantic boy, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. <laughs> sweet young romantic. <laughs> he's trying to get someone. He's he knows someone's getting paid. But to he's pay. so nice. <laughs> like he does that thing with his eyes where he looks like a puppy dog. I don't think he's that nice. Who Joe? Oh, he's kind of a dick. Yeah, he's kind of a dick. He's, he's very obsessive. Selfish. He's selfish. He gets mad at her in the car, uh, just because she maybe wasn't interested in him. He's kind of whiny. So he's whiny, and it's like if she's not interested in you, it's not. It's not her fault. You're right, Cam- your yeah. Cameron is kind he's, of selfish. I, yeah, I think he's, maybe when we were younger, we thought he was the nice guy because he's he's played by a sweet guy. Yeah. But Cameron- That's what I mean, yeah. Cameron's kind of a, like a selfish dick. Also, when he, the first day at school, he sees Bianca, and yeah. obviously he's love struck, but he doesn't know anything about her. He's just making a bunch of assumptions about her. She might be a terrible person. Yeah. But he's like, no, nah, man, she's, she's better you than You don't know, that. man. And I'm like- I think Michael would know better than you because he goes to school with her. Like, he knows her, and you're just going based off just the looks, mm-hmm. the looks of this person. So you're in love with what she looks like. So really, it's the lust, not love. I agree. I agree. And then he didn't have the balls to ask her to prom forever. True. Yeah. Even though she kissed him already. And ironically, even though he lies about knowing French to tutor, JGL speaks French. Is Cameron just the worst person alive? He's not the worst person <laughs> alive. He's kind of terrible when you think about it. 
he he's like he's gonna sabotage her French lessons. Yes. And yeah, he's just he's very selfish. Yeah. All it's he all cares about, about him. himself. It's yeah, all about you're him. right. He's kind of a fucking dick. I'm telling you, Cameron is not a nice guy. Everything's about him. The puppy face really hides it so well. Yeah, because <laughs> Joseph Gordon Levin is a charming guy. But man, it's just when he's after the party and he's sulking, it's cause cause she didn't choose him. And he's like, Oh, this is t- 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 <laughs> you need to ride home fine. I guess like how could you not how could you not give me attention? And then he, he's just like crying to her about it. I well, was like, yeah, I love Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but I think you're right. Yeah. So, sweet young romantic boy still is the trope. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> we have the beautiful popular girl played by Bianca. You got to have the beautiful pro- popular girl in a high school teen comedy. Mm-hmm. At least one. We also have the popular jerk, which is Joey clearly is the popular jerk. Definitely playing like an Italian <laughs> dishbag. <laughs> he does a good job. Who's yeah. the actor that plays Joey in this movie? Andrew Keegan. He's he's great. He's, he's yeah, a he's, scene stealer. He's a great antagonist in this yeah. movie. He's very funny. You know, Joey's insanely self centered. He's a model. He he models recently for tube socks. He's got a hemorrhoid ad coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so he's super funny. Then we have he wears fucking loafers to class. <laughs> yeah. There's a usually money or a bet involved in mm. a lot of high school movies. Yes, yes. Somehow. Obviously, uh, the bet is that, or the the money is that Joey paying Patrick Verona to go out with Kat so that he can try to go out with Bianca. We have a grand gesture, which in this film is obviously Patrick buying Kat the guitar. That's not the grand gesture I'm talking about. That's the apology. Come on, grand gesture. What's the grand gesture? I'm. Oh, the uh, the band, the marching band song. The singing. Yeah, the singing. singing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The singing. <laughs> it is a grand gesture. Frankie Valley, right? Yes. Is he saying Frankie Valley? Yeah. Is that who it is? Is that, is that, yeah. Uh, yeah. I love you, baby. Well, I mean, yeah, that's Frankie Valley. Is it? Hold on, let me double check. Double check. I could be wrong. I will say that, um, so Julia Stiles actually chose the song. She, she suggested that song uh, for, I think they had something else in mind, or they just weren't certain about one, but she's the one who suggested that song, I Love You, Baby. And then Heath Ledger did all of his own singing, and that's all on site singing of his it wasn't done in a recording booth it wasn't done in post-production like he did that singing the day of nobody knew he was a singer or could sing and he has a fantastic voice and so julie Stiles says that was her favorite day of filming because he just surprised everybody with that and just performed that scene for hours all day and just absolutely destroyed it it is frankie valley can't take my eyes off of you you're like heaven to touch don't look at me when you say that it's weird i want to yes you look at me look at me Look at me. <laughs> Sick reference. Sick reference, bro. <laughs> I want to hold you so close. All right. Uh, what else do we have? The grand gesture, the singing, but also, like you said, the guitar is what the apology, the third act apology, which always yeah. happens at the end of a romantic comedy and a high school comedy. <laughs> the money didn't matter. Of course, we have to have prom. It's a high school teen movie. Mm-hmm. Got to have prom. Got to have prom. Although right? this movie was missing the prom dressing montage oh, of getting point. dresses and the guys getting tuxes. They didn't have that montage in this That's one. That's a good point. You know, this usually has that. But you know what it had? What? In addition to all this, a 1990s titty flash. <laughs> For no reason. Julia Stiles flashes her soccer coach in detention. Obviously to help Patrick sneak out, but yeah. could have waited a half hour for him to get out of detention. I know. I mean, it can't be that long of a detention. Can you imagine flashing your teacher? <laughs> like the things that go on in this high school. It's sort of like... How in Hogwarts you're in immediate danger of crazy things happen. Crazy mm-hmm. things happen in the school. The guidance counselor is writing erotica <laughs> and flirting with Patrick Verona. Yeah. And, and then, then the deleted scene, too. She's flashing her teacher. Like, this is crazy stuff. Yeah. The, the, the deleted scene with Allison Janney in the credits is like her hooking up with another teacher in the hallway and they yeah. catch her. I love the credit the credits uh, deleted scenes. Bloopers. The bloopers. Yeah. Blooper reels are great. I miss bloopers. Yeah, they should do more blooper reels because I watch the entire credits because the blooper reels are fantastic. Bloopers are fantastic. I really I, do. I love it. Them. Me too. I miss them. But yeah, movie movie schools are never never truly real schools. I saw this great TikTok of this kid and his buddies. They recorded him approaching every one of their teachers and calling him them by their first name. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a dozen teachers, and they all had a, a, a ridiculous reaction. Like, one teacher was like, what the fuck did you call me? <laughs> it was fantastic. It reminded kid, me of this movie. I remember movie. kids in high school did that. I wasn't part of it. Yeah, we were never that cool. Like, I, I don't think I would ever. I didn't say you did it. I'm just saying kids did it. They did it, yeah. Yeah, I did not do you it. You were a nice student. You were a good guy. I guess. You were a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> the soundtrack of this movie also slaps. Letters from Cleo, they're the band that's featured in multiple scenes. They're also the band that's rocking out on the top of the giant fucking high oh, school yeah, at the end of the, the movie. End, yeah. So that the ending of this movie Very MTV. For no reason, yeah. It was, I guess, MDB yeah. at the time. A 360 helicopter <laughs> shot of a band playing on top of this. It's high just a school. music video then. Insane yeah. shot. Letters from Cleo is that band. Now, every time they did this shot, it cost five hundred thousand dollars for the helicopter to go up and do it. So, Whoa! So they did it in a, only a couple of takes, but it's crazy. Why is it that much money? It costs a lot of money to do that, man. I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah, things weren't. I mean, that's crazy. Get wow. a helicopter up in front on top of a school. By the way, this school is pretty wild. This movie was shot in Washington. It takes place in Seattle. The high school fictionally is called Padua High School. But it was shot at this gorgeous high school in Tacoma, Washington called Stadium High School. It was first built as a Grand Chateau-style railroad station, hotel. But after it suffered fire damage, it was renovated into a high school. It basically looks like fucking Hogwarts except brick. It looks great. It's insane. It looks yeah. like a castle. It's like the, the nicest public school I've ever seen. If it is a public school, I'm not sure. I mean for the movie. Well, for, well, I mean, this is just a movie. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. For I'm just saying. I've never, oh, like this. The, yeah, I've never seen a public school look so nice. Oh, in a well, in a movie. Yeah. That's what we're talking about as a movie, man. No, but like, I thought you meant that. I thought you said. I thought you said spider, <laughs> spider. I thought you said get a but drink. But speaking of the high school, they actually didn't have uh, the stadium, even though it's called Stadium High School in real life. So they went to Lincoln High School, which is in the same area, to shoot the entire marching band singing sequence. So that that was at a different school. Oh my God, yeah, I've been duped. How, I've been duped, it, man. Your life's changed forever, hasn't it? My life has been changed forever because this movie exists. Ah, uh-huh. because I love it. This is this is a really good movie. But I still really think good. the first half is weaker than the second half. I think the second. I agree. The second half, I think, is really strong. The courtship is really entertaining for me. I mean, I love the so. First is the drunk party where they he finally gets to talk to her and bond with her by helping her when she's drunk. And then he's a good guy and takes her home and makes sure she's okay. And does not accept her kiss. Exactly. He does not accept her kiss, which um, confuses her and pisses her off. And then he's in trouble. He's basically in the doghouse for a while. And then he does the song. I get, love uh, you, yep. baby. Then he gets detention. And she breaks him out of detention. By flashing and they go teacher. paintballing. Well, paintball balling. Paintball. Not like shooting paintball. Yeah. It's just balloons filled with paint. Safe paintball. It's balloons filled with paint. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's really a thing or they just built that for the movie? I think it's really a thing. Like, why not? It looks like fun. Yeah, it does. I mean, they had like the, the body suits and the goggles and everything. Seem like. I'm not going to lie. I smiled the whole time during that scene. It's a great scene. It's very sweet. It's one of my favorite date scenes in the movie. It's endearing as the, hell. The paintball scene is fantastic and it's really cute and they have a great kiss and. It's it's a very charming sequence. Paint balls. That's what they called it. Paint balls. And then I love when they have their little chat on the porch and their hair is all colored in different paints. It's great. They have a toxic relationship, though. Oh, yeah. Because after they, at the end of the date, they get in a fight and, and he walks And he off. pulls out a cigarette. Yeah. And he's like, fuck, <laughs> can't take this woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is lying to her. It's true. He is lying to her face. Yes. He does. Because she asks, "Why? what are your intentions? Why do you want to take What do you get out of so it? Bad? Yeah. Nothing. I just for the pleasure of your company. Mm-hmm. So he's kind of a dick. I wonder why they let him keep his Australian accent for this. It's subtle. It's not super strong. Yeah. But maybe it was tough for him to get rid of it. Or maybe they just thought he was even more charming with it. Probably. I think. I think he's yeah more charming because it's not a super. It's not a super thick Australian accent. It's just. Kind it's of, yeah. It's very. It's middle of the line. It's blended together. They with explain American. in the movie. He says the accent's real. I grew up in Australia till I was ten. Yeah. So it's like a subtle. Australian accent. I think that they did it. I think they let him have it a little bit just because they liked it. Because I think uh, that's what I would do. Me too. I'd be like, it's your, your accent's great. Like, just keep it. Just do it. Just do it, man. Just do it's it. Fucking Nike, Heath, just do it's it. Fucking Heath Ledger. <laughs> he beat out two, a uh, couple of great actors. So he beat out Heath Ledger. Beat out Josh Hartnett and Ashton Kutcher. They were the other two finalists for the role of Patrick. Josh was a huge star at the time too. Yeah. He was a massive yeah. teen star and, and early twenty star. I could have seen him doing this role. I mean, yeah, Josh would have been fine in this role. Ashton Kutcher, I don't know, though. I have Ashton Kutcher in serious roles. Not, well, it's not a serious role, but, yeah, it's, but it's, it's not sort goofy. Of like the bad, like doing yeah. a bad boy. I don't think Ashton Kutcher could yeah. do the bad boy that well. Yeah, I don't think he could either. I don't think he could pull that off. The badass. Like, what's the baddest he's ever been in a movie? Butterfly Effect? <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's it. Yeah, he's I not guess. even a, he's not even a badass in that. He's just a guy. Yeah, he's usually either goofy or just some kind of comedy. That's what he's best at. This he's really good at. Because Josh Hart had played a version of this type of character in The Faculty. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. The lone wolf, smoking cigs, smoking cigarettes, tough guy, badass of the school. Makes pens with <laughs> drugs in it, cocaine. He makes his own cocaine, right? Or yeah, his own it's, speed. No, it's, it's speed. It's like yeah, speed. It's Adderall. Oh yeah, it's, it's yeah, ground so up Adderall. Ground up Adderall. His, yeah. own, his own concoction of Adderall, yeah. and that's what dehydrates the aliens, right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Science, Science, bitch. bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Jake's. <laughs> so did you know that there are? No, I didn't. <laughs> some Nolan actors in this movie, obviously. Uh huh. Heath Ledger, Justin Gordon Levitt, and Dave Krummeltz. They would go on to star in Christopher Nolan movies. Ledger, obviously, in The Dark Knight in 2008. He won Best Supporting Actor for this, obviously, posthumously. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is in both Inception in 2010 and The Dark Knight Rises in 2012. Which Nolan I, abandoned him. Which I just watched <laughs> the other night, and I fucking loved it. Inception? No, oh, Dark, Dark Knight Rises. Rises. Yeah, yeah. And then David Krummeltz was just in Oppenheimer. Oh, yeah. I saw this great interview with, Opp- with uh, Krummeltz. And he said the first scene he shot in Oppenheimer, not to go on an Oppenheimer tangent, I think it's a great Krummelt story, though, is with hey, tell him, whatever story with him you and want, Killian man. in the train compartment. And it's that first one when he feeds them the orange, like you need to eat something. They talk about how, you know, being Jewish people in the science fields is just a t- it's tough for them that with the prejudices. And Krummelt said that that was the first scene he shot in the movie, and he was very intimidated by doing it. But he also said that Nolan made him do it like 12 times, 13 times. Nolan doesn't need to shoot that many takes. Killian did his in like one or two. Because it's killing Murphy, but Krummeltz said that he was really worried, and he he was worried he was going to get fired the next day oh because God. he thought he did such a bad job. And he said something, and the interview he said something like, "Nolan came up to him, and he's like, I don't really understand what you're doing here in 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 this scene right now." Mm-hmm. But they eventually got through it, and it worked out fine. And obviously, Krummeltz is terrific in the movie; he's yeah. really great in Oppenheimer. I really enjoyed his performance. But he, that was his first day on set, and he went home and he literally thought he was going to get fired from Oppenheimer the wow. next day. Damn. Because he, he didn't. No one's like, I don't know what you're doing. Holy shit. But not in like a bad way. Just no, yeah, like, like a, I'm trying to figure it yeah, out. Just figuring out the performance, yeah. I guess. You know what I mean? Because, you know, it's a it's a big scene. But also, he was talking about how he was slightly intimidated by the IMAX cameras because they're in this train compartment. Obviously, it's a set, but the cameras are fucking massive. He's like, Kill- Killian's like hunched in the corner underneath the camera. <laughs> and I'm sitting there messing up all my takes, or just we have to keep doing my takes. And I feel bad for Killian Murphy just, just crouched in the corner of the compartment. <laughs> Because <laughs> they got they get in there. Yeah, with I those. never thought about the reverse. Like the other actor is definitely affected by the camera size, especially the, that, that movie because there's so many close-ups in that movie. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> well, he got through it, and everyone loves him in that movie. Yeah, it was a really interesting interview that I, that clip specifically that I saw. Yeah, it's it's a tough thing. You're in a huge Christopher Nolan movie with Killian Murphy, and it's like holy fuck, this is it. But Crumbles has always been a really solid actor. Very reliable. And you're right. The first like half hour of this movie. He's basically Morpheus for us, and <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt is Neo. You know, he's asking all the questions, like, where we are. And, you know, Krummeltz, who plays Michael, is explaining everything like Morpheus. Let basically. us make them remember. <laughs> <laughs> so he's showing them ropes, showing them the school, showing them the ship, the Nebuchadnezzar, everything like that. <laughs> totally ripped off the name from The Matrix. Totally did. Actually, this came out the same weekend as The Matrix came in second place at the box office in 1999. Oh, wow. Yeah. Look at that. Holy shit. Now, speaking of. Speaking of, exactly. You like that segue? That's a great segue. Thanks, bro. Thanks, bro. Well, how about we head into our intermission, and then we'll get back to 10 Things I Hate About You. I want to talk about the dad when we get back. Oh, the dad. The, I love the dad. He's great. Walter's so, great. Before you continue, you got to get tickets to our live show in Boston. It's happening on April 18th at the Middle East. If you're in Massachusetts or in New England, make the drive to... The city to come see us live in person. Tickets are on sale. You can go to our website, RaidersOfLostPodcast.com and get them there. We'll put them in the description of this episode. Also, just go on our Instagram, link in the bio. Very easy to find the tickets. They're only like 20 bucks or something like that. Yeah, something like 22 that. bucks. Yeah. They're pretty cheap. And we'd love to see you all in person. We hope Bean we'll, town. we'll have a great show in the city. But also, you can become a patron today at Patreon.com slash RaidersOfLostPodcast. It's the best way to support our show financially because... Not only do you get awesome perks, but you get to help Anthony support his Trader Joe's I just went today. And get Juno his good food. Uh, Patreon has different tiers of memberships, and each tier going up the ladder has awesome perks like access to our Discord, which is a private film community. You have to be a member on Patreon in order to access our Discord, private watch parties, custom episodes. You pick a topic. We'll do it for you. 
So many great perks. They get better and better the more you pay for your membership. You can also help the show immensely by leaving those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Nice. Because that's how people find us. That's how we chart. We need you guys to leave these reviews so I can sleep at night. <laughs> leave a fucking review. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please leave a review. Please, Lou. You don't know where I've been, Lou. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for leaving those five-star ratings and reviews, everybody. I'll read one in a moment. Wow. That was a lot. Sure was. <laughs> uh, speaking of, this episode, of course, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code RAIDERS10 at MoviePosters.com. They get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. So... Be sure to go to MoviePosters.com and use our promo code RAIDERS10 right now to get 10% off your order immediately. Immediately. All right. All right. Should we get into the intermission, Anthony? Let's get in there, dog. All right. You ready for this movie quote? Oh, I'm ready. I can't tell if it's going to be easy or hard for you. I don't know. This is not a democracy. It's a cheerocracy. Oh, let's bring it on. That sure is. (laughs) Easy or hard? Easy. Easy peasy. And squeezy. Also, an actor in this movie was in that movie. It's pretty funny how we... I feel like I've seen that movie like seven times. Like it was that on, was, yeah, it was we on a lot. I feel like it was... Yeah. Was it on Comedy Central or was it on like Nick? I can't remember. It was on something. It was on something I don't think it was on Nick. Up. It was on TV pretty often. Yeah, it was on television. Quite a bit. It aired. Like TNT. Yeah. yeah. Like this, the channel in the 30s. Like th- it was like 30 or 31, remember? We definitely watched it a lot. It was just on TV a lot. Yeah. Anyways, this is before you could choose <laughs> what you watch. Yeah, you just had a, three options. You had to put a channel on whatever's playing. <laughs> that's what you have to fucking watch. All the good old days. Okay, here's my quote. I've never been alone with a man before, even with my dress on. With my dress off, it's most unusual. What is that? <laughs> Say it again. I've never been alone with a man before, even with my dress on. With my dress off, it's most unusual. I don't know. That is Audrey Hepburn in Roman Holiday. Oh. 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 It's a good one. One great wardrobe in that one. Yeah, they guess this movie release here. Napoleon Dynamite. 2004. Bingo was his name O. And Eat Anthony the food. got it right. Eat the food. Tina. Tina. You have really great skills. <laughs> You're just jealous because I've been talking to babes online all day. How much do you want to bet I can throw this pixie in a quarter mile? <laughs> how much do you want to bet I can throw us over those mountains? <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Rico. Oh, my God. What year did Roman Holiday come out? 1960. No, 1950. No. No. 1962. 53. Oh, I knew it was the 50s. God damn it. <laughs> and then why'd you say it? Because I didn't. Anthony, I didn't say it. <laughs> okay? Jesus, man. Just <laughs> fucking guess this pop quiz. <laughs> Who directed 13? 13? Didn't you do this quiz question a month ago? No, but I talked about I talked about it in an episode. Uh-huh. Who directed 13? Would that be Catherine Hardwick? You know what I think I did do? Yeah, a... you did. <laughs> you want the Twilight episode. Yeah, you want to do a new one? You bozo? It's because we recorded it so long Who ago. Who directed Twilight? <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Hardwick. Yes. Yes. You got it, man. <laughs> got two. You got the price of one. Pretty fucking good. Kick anything by me. Anyways, here's my quiz question. Waiting on bated breath. The life of Roman Holiday screenwriter was turned into an acclaimed biopic film starring a famous TV actor. What is that film called? So the film is about the writer of Roman Holiday? He was a famous writer. Was it Truman Capote? Screenwriter. Oh. Well, I mean, Capote, you wrote a couple of scripts. He wrote the but... book, right? I don't know. Something. Oh, at breakfast at Tiffany's, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, say it one more time. The question. So, the screenwriter of Roman Holiday, an acclaimed screenwriter, 
and his, um, a biopic about his life was turned was made with a famous TV actor, an American, American. And not too long ago either. This actor got nominated for an Oscar as well. Was it? Um... Do you want to give me the actor? Brian Cranston? Yes. You know the film. It's the movie called... God damn. I can picture him. He's got glasses. He's got glasses. <laughs> <laughs> He's got glasses and a ponytail. <laughs> he writes in the tub? Yeah, I know. Um, fucking tr- Trumbo. Yes, Trumbo. Let's go. Yeah, High you five. got it. You got it, man. <laughs> nice, man. You got it. That was a good answer. You had it. Yeah, thanks, man. It's in there somewhere, dude. Oh, yeah. You got it. You squeeze it out. You eked through it. You eked by it. <laughs> I got it, man. Proud of you, man. Thanks, dude. I didn't think you would get it. I didn't think I was going to get it either. I did have to fucking walk you there. <laughs> you did not I walk held, me I there. Held your I, hand. No, listen. I held your hand. You were a brick wall that I was throwing a tennis ball off of. I, I, just, no, I, carried I, walked, you. I walked myself there, I, man. I picked you up and put you on top of the top of the wall so no, you could you climb not, over it. you did not, man. You did not. <laughs> did not. You did not. <laughs> did not hit her. I didn't need your fucking help. <laughs> <laughs> you, <did. laughs> you kidding me? I wanted you to think that you were helping me. <laughs> so I wanted to give you the satisfaction, but since you're bragging about it, I'm taking it away. I'm I knew not satisfied about it. The whole time, I'm not man. satisfied. Did I get it right or not? You got it right. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Who we got for haters this week besides you? <laughs> uh, we got... Uh, we just recorded yesterday, so we only have one. But it's a good one. So we uh, actually just collaborated with PlayStation and Naughty Dog on some content for The Last of Us Part Two Remastered. And then we tweeted about it. And then Lou on Twitter wrote, You guys are getting too popular. You guys have to be low-key and loyal to your fans only. Unsubscribe! <laughs> All jokes, you guys are getting bigger and bigger, and I love to see it. Just don't forget the fans. We would never forget you. And we got to pay the rent. And it's also so fun to do. Yeah. Also, in my Attack on Titan episode, on a clip from it, Sam wrote... On a clip from it. On a clip from it, <laughs> Sam wrote... Anthony kept referring to the film as a show, re- kept referring to it as a film, not show. <laughs> Unsubscribe. It's so funny how we always talk about shows and we call them movies. Like yeah, films I can't, it's just like habit, like you can't not say it. And that's it for our unsubscribes to this episode. All right, we have a great five-star review from Optic. James's tattoo. Writing this review because I really want him to get a tattoo. I'm thinking the V for... for I'm thinking the V for Vendetta because it can be a symbol for victory. In all seriousness, I'm a big movie buff, and these two have enabled me to sink deeper into my obsession. They make it fun and keep it light. Keep up the great works, boys. Thanks, pal. Do you remember what I had said? For your tattoo? Yeah, if I got five, if we got 5,000 5, ratings, ratings, I'd get a tattoo. You guys start making content about advertising that. I know I should because we're at Promote that tattoo, man. 829 on Apple. Yeah. You could get it. Like, people would sign. People would do that for you. If I was – I would do that if I, I haven't already. I've already – well, I actually never left a written review of the show. Seems, I, seems I did. immoral. It's I cheating. Did. Have you ever seen my review? No. I wrote. <laughs> I know it's going to be something about me. What, what was the review? Anthony sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Get him off the mic. <laughs> Anonymous. I was doing fine without you. Go back to England. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will. It was just me and Juno and Natalie. That was it. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> What's your streaming recommendation? Roman Holiday is my streaming recommendation. What it's a perfect know? Valentine's Day movie to watch. One of the best rom- romantic films ever made. What a lazy movie trip <laughs> template. You did all the same movie. Because <laughs> it's a great movie. Sure is. It's not lazy. It's tasteful. My recommendation is... Don't, tw- don't be bad because you got the first two wrong. My recommendation is 21 Jump Street on Hulu. How's that even a Valentine's Day themed movie? Who said I had to do anything Valentine's Day themed? I didn't say you have to, but it's, it was lazy. It was lazy. <laughs> it's, a t- it's a great teen comedy. That's what it is. It's a great teen comedy. You know what? I love the uh, someone sent me uh, the video of the spoken word poetry where Jonah Hill goes up. He goes, noises, waving my arms, <laughs> <laughs> insipid insights, social commentary, Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia. Ah, uh! <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny! Oh my god, we're cracking up, man. All right, <laughs> let's get back into ten things I hate about you. And you wanted to talk about the dad. I fucking love the dad of this. He's so funny. So, what's his name? Walter. He's the father of Cat and Bianca. And I don't know. I've seen this actor. I feel like I've seen him a hundred times. I just can't. I just don't know him by name. 
He kind of reminds me of Shia LaBeouf's dad in Transformers. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. I can see that. Kind of looks like him. Yeah. But he's he's hysterical in this movie. And, I mean, he's off. Obviously, he's the controlling dad. But they play it to, like, this comedic tone where it's just, like, you're kind of on his side because he's so funny. And he's <laughs> he's a doctor. And he has a fucking phone every time. But um, what kind of doctor? He delivers, delivers, delivers babies. babies. Yeah, yeah, he delivers babies. And he's always saying that his daughters are going to get pregnant if they ever date. So yeah. that's a great funny joke. That's, that's his fear. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, he, he has the, the pregnant um, vest. Yeah. He makes the girls wear before they go out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny shit like that. And But there's also like a dark tone like his wife left him and left the family. But yeah. they don't talk about it much. But there's yeah. a couple of comments about it. But it's clearly a source of cat in his in her personality at this time. Especially yeah. more probably what Joey did to her. But especially, like, I think her mother leaving them has left the imprint on her for sure. Yeah, I wonder why they didn't explore it a little bit more in the film. Well, I know that they originally were going to do more of a motif of suicide and make it darker oh, really? like that. Damn. But I think they changed it to the mother leaving. But then, really, it seems like the, her personality ha- is a result of Joey and what he did to her when they, she was in ninth grade with him. Gotcha. That's my guess, because really, they don't explore the mother at all. Even though you would think that that's the source of her trauma and her pain. Yeah, there's just literally just like one comment about it. Yeah, you're right. But the dad's hysterical. And what this movie does really well that a lot of movies pre-2005 like 2005 did really well, even a more contemporary comedy like this, is the slapstick stuff that sort of is in place in the 70s or there's 80s comedy. There's some good comedy. stuff, yeah. There's some great slapstick. Yeah. Like when the dad's stretching on the on the roof. He, first he does 10 crunches. He's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> he's like done working out. And he takes that stretching thing and it shoots out of his hands. Yeah. And he's like, no big deal. And, and then, then there's the, the guy. The, the neighbor drops it down from below. From yeah. He's like, hey, thanks, thanks, Mike. And then at the football game, uh, a person gets like hit with a ball and like gets knocked out in the background. Yeah. Like there's a bunch of like, you're right, slapstick physical comedy. Just like it doesn't doesn't quite fit the movie. But it's still funny. Yeah. It's fun to see. You don't see stuff like that anymore. Yeah. it's kind of, It kind of feels a little out of place, but also it's welcome. It feels like time. it belongs in a movie like Airplane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it just, they just pepper in here and there. It's like it was being phased out of movies. So they got a couple in there. <laughs> There's actually, th- this movie, even though it's, you know, super corny at times and not the most visually stunning film because most teen comedies aren't. There's a really terrific shot. My favorite shot in this movie is when there's the party that's being thrown, the the NBA kid, the leader of the NBA kids. Uh, yeah, doing his cigar Bo, night. What's it? Bo, Bo. Bo. Bro? No, it's like Bogey. Something like that. Boogie. I think his name is Boogie. Something like that. And he's having a party just with the NBAs, and it's like they have cigars and stuff, and it's like the finer things Don't in life. Don't touch anything. And then the way Michael gets back at him is he – creates flyers of his own for the party of free beer and just like a huge rager a huge party and then they go to the top of the stairs him and cameron and he's like you ready I'm like yeah and they throw all the pamphlets and all the flyers yes. for the party yeah, down yeah. the stairwell yeah and there's a shot from below up of the flyers falling down the stairs as well as high schoolers just reaching out and grabbing great it. song it's playing a really great shot yeah. shot i'm like wow that's fucking artistic as shit yeah and it's, a, it's the perfect song choice i can't remember what the song was but i remember i got like goosebumps when I saw that shot. It was very good. You're right. Yeah, I was it watching was it. I'm like, good. this is a really good shot. Yeah, I was like, this doesn't belong in this movie. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> You're right. It was a great shot. And another trope about teen comedies is homes are always so stunning and beautiful. Like the girl's home is insanely perfect. Like the su- perfect suburbia. Everything, every house is massive. Well, I think that's one of the tropes of the movie that they do on purpose because this movie's kind of meta yeah it kind of knows what it is it's at times. almost a scream yeah. sort of but yeah. not in your face as much yeah it knows but also it doesn't want you to know that it knows in a lot of ways where a scream knows and it wants you to know that it's a horror movie this is it knows it's a movie but but it's that shot i think where it's the 180 pan of the entire neighborhood and you're just looking at it, you're like this is the quote-unquote mid- upper middle class oasis like yeah. in heaven mm-hmm. and then it's that great. Then the shot actually turns into a crane shot where it pans into the living room window of mm-hmm. she's reading, cats reading the bell jar, which they make fun of in the movie, the not another T movie, 
where she's reading the book like how to get the popular jock guy to like you <laughs> and then her crush is like how to get the girl that you have a crush on who's in love with the popular jock guy to get love you back <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's so funny there's something that is is missing from the film that i think would make it really great just a little bit more background on some of the leads that can be provided by seeing what their homes are like Something that's very informing for our characters seeing their home. Where's Patrick Verona live? Yeah, where are the, <laughs> that's the that's the one. My one big con to the movie is you only see Bianca and Kat's home. You don't see anyone else's home, and so I'm whenever I watch this movie, and I was watching it last night, and I was thinking like, what's Patrick's home like? Like, and what's what's uh, Cameron's home like? We know we're at Crumholtz's house a couple of times, like getting ready to go out. But I, I was I just it's just something that if they had shown that, I think it would have helped improve the film and make it even better. Yeah, because Patrick Verona, like I said, he the movie for me doesn't really tar- start taking off until he's involved with the plot. Yeah. From before that, he's just sort of in the background. They point to him and talk about him a little bit, the rumors here and there. But I think he's so, so important to this movie. Him and Kat's relationship is the best part for sure because their relationship supersedes the cliche relationship of the hopeless romantic with the popular girl. The, re- the relationship between the bad boy, the charming bad boy, and the bad girl – that's what's more interesting. They're ironically perfect for each other. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're you so can perfect. tell there's no way this relationship would last. No way. No oh fucking way. It would be way. a disaster. It, it, all they would do is fight. Yeah. That's kind of all, they, all do they do. Fight. Yeah. All they would do is fight. They're just too similar. They it's just a teen, teen comedy where you're like, yeah, that's not going to last. <laughs> a lot of fun while they, heck, while they can. So there's actually also a connection to the Batman movies with this. Did you know that? Like the Matt Reeves Batman? No, just the Batman movies in general. All of them. Oh yeah, it was Heath Ledger. Is there something else? There's more. Uh-huh. So, so all Batman. It's a multiple. So, oh, okay. So Patrick sings "Can't Take My Eyes Off You" by sure. Frank Valli to Cat. This makes Heath Ledger the third actor to sing this song prior to playing a Batman villain. Mm. The first was Christopher Walken in The Deer Hunter before going to play Max Shrek in Batman Returns. Michelle Pfeiffer in The Fabulous Baker Boys before going to play Selena Kyle Catwoman in Batman Returns. And on top of that. Christopher Walken won an Oscar for The Deer Hunter. Michelle Pfeiffer received an Oscar nomination for The Fabulous Baker Boys. While Ledger did not receive an Oscar nom for this film, he did win in the same category as Walken for playing the Joker in The Dark Knight. I have another Batman connection. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? All three of them sang that song in movies and became Batman villains. It's interesting. There's also another one. So Heath Ledger drew on two famous actors for his performance in this film. First, he drew on Richard Burton for his portrayal of The Taming of the Shrew. He played the same character. As well as Jack Nicholson. That makes sense. So Richard Burton and Jack Nicholson actually both played the Joker in Batman movies, ironically. So the thing with Jack, and I read this before I saw the film last night, and it made total sense. So he, with Jack Nicholson, he used Jack's smile and his cheekiness. Yeah, yeah. So you see, like, Patrick will react to things just with, like, a big grin, a big smile, and, like, a flirtatious eye. That's such a Jack move. That big, huge smile. So he drew that from all of Jack Nicholson's performances. Like he put that into the Patrick Verona character. You Just can see. really see that all of his big smiles. Like the gr- he'll do a grin instead of actually responding. And he is a really great character. He's insanely memorable. I think Kat's a really great character as well. And I'm really drawn to her. And you know, this person we find she's probably the the most we learn about in the entire yeah. film. Yeah. She has a past where uh, Bianca describes her. She used to be popular. You can assume she used to be popular in the her freshman year when she used to date Joey. But then after Joey dumped her because she didn't want to have sex anymore, they had sex once and she didn't want to and she felt pressured and she didn't want to she wanted to wait after that. And then he dumped her. That's when she turned into basically the cat that we kind of all know and she started just going in that direction. But you understand why she has become this heinous bitch according to <laughs> according to <laughs> the the guidance counselor in the entire school. But um, I think she's a really, really fun character. And I, I love watching Julie Stiles on screen. I think she's terrific in this movie. I mean, I just love the the first reveal of her in the opening montage of all the kids going to school. And there's the popular girl singing in their convertible to a pop song. And then it cuts to Kat. And she's listening to, like, punk rock. And she just, like, glares at them. I was like, this is a perfect <laughs> shot that tells you everything you need to know about the character. She's isolated. She doesn't want to fit in. Uh, she likes doing things her own way. She drives this vintage old car. So I think that that's things like that. This movie does a great job of showcasing just with the how they look and how they act, everything you need to know about the character. Have you ever heard about 10 Things I Hate About Life? No. It's a movie, a canceled and unfinished American romantic comedy directed by 
Gills Younger, starring oh, the director of this, the director of this, yeah. and she also wrote it, starring Evan Rachel Wood, Thomas McDowell, and Billy Campbell. Now, the characters meet while attempting suicide and fall in love in the film. Now, this film isn't a direct sequel to Ten Things I Hate About You, but it's sort of explored the same themes. And filming began in late 2012 on this picture, but it was interrupted after two months due to management changes at the production company and Evan Rachel Wood's pregnancy. In late 2000, 2013, production was set to resume with an estimated wrap date for April 2014. Although the filming schedule was delayed indefinitely after Wood's departure, she left the project. The producers ended up suing Evan Rachel Wood for $30 million for breach of contract. However, her lawyers responded saying that Wood was never paid properly for the amount of work she had already done on the project, which is why she left the production because she was not paid what her contract was supposed to say. According to 2021, the lawsuit was still ongoing. Oh my god. But the film seems unlikely. There are some behind the scenes stills. They shot some stuff? They shot like weeks of production, uh -huh. yeah. It just it's unfinished. Wow. And it just got canceled. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Jamie Bell ended it. <laughs> Jamie Bell ruined the movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, she left the production. You know? I know, but that one that first bit about her getting pregnant and yeah. delaying it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gil Gun Gil Junger hates Jamie Bell. <laughs> Probably. But yeah, th there's another Movie in this kind of verse. Wow. Yeah, the 10 things verse never happened. Yeah. I mean, I'm not that mad about it. You know what I love about this movie, too, is the opening. It's a Touchstone Pictures film. So I love that old Touchstone yeah. Pictures logo and opening graphic where it's the, the blue bar on the bottom third of the screen with the, the, the light, symbol on the yeah. left. So many it's of like our glisten. So many of our favorite movies from the '90s have are from this like production company mm -hmm. and have that in the opening. Like I remember, like movies like Three Ninjas had that. Just I, it's so nostalgic to me. So as soon as I saw that, I hadn't seen this movie in like 15 years. And as soon as that played, I'm like, fuck yes. It's a nostalgia factor. There's a couple of companies when you see them, you're and they're just dated because they went, fell under or were purchased. And Touchstone, I think, was purchased by Universal Disney. Disney in. When I see, like you said, one of the company logos, I'm like, oh my god, this is great. Screen Gems was one, yeah, that was super popular in the '90s and 2000s. I think they're still, I think they're making a comeback. It's, but it's like I do kind of miss the days where there was just one studio, but now there's sometimes like ten <laughs> logos. All oh, before a movie, yeah. like production companies. Yeah, it's so funny sometimes. Also, in addition to the soundtrack being heavily full of letters to Khalil, the band that's featured in the film. Bare Naked Ladies has a banger in the opening of this movie. It's been one week since, since I looked, looked at you. you. Or whatever. I what, saw a, your face. what a hit. What, what a, a hit. What a banger. Oh, my God. And then also, uh, Notorious B.I.G. has a song in this. Biggie's got a song in this. He's got Hypnotizers in this. That's the song that Julia Stiles' character Kat dances to oh, yeah, on yeah, the yeah. table at the party. Also, that scene where she dances on the table is the reason she got a movie, uh, the role in, what's that dance movie? Um, Crap, what's it called? Who's in it with her? She's, I can't remember the, any of the act, other Drew actors. Drew is in a dance movie? Yeah, yeah, she's, it's a really famous dance movie. Is that the Channing Tatum one? No, no. Uh, Julia it's Stiles. Step Up. Dance movie, hold on, hold on. Save the Last Dance. Sounds familiar. You've seen it, definitely. Remember, she moves to, what is it, Chicago or something like that? Chicago? She, she moves to Chicago. She's a, I think she gets cut from Juilliard. Oh, yeah. Oh, with, um... Who is it? Tate Diggs is in it? Who is it? Oh, Sean Patrick Thomas. Kerry Washington's in it. Oh my god, I remember this. Yeah, I remember this. But she landed that movie because of the dance scene in this movie. Oh, interesting. Interesting. She was huge in the early 2000s. Yeah. And then she got born, too. Oh yeah, she's Nikki and born. Yeah. Damn. Save the Last Dance. Also a banger. Speaking of Julia, so, I mean, the... Probably the best bit of acting in the whole movie is her giving, finally reciting the poem in front of class at the end of the film. And it's a great scene. It's a great one take where she breaks down in the middle of the poem but finishes it through tears. She did that in just in one take. They didn't film any other takes. And the director wasn't expecting her to cry, but just to read it emotionally. But uh, Julia Stiles did that one take of it, and they were like, we got it. So for, it's great when like such an iconic moment in a film is something that's done without rep repetition and just came naturally and it was just like a very in the moment kind of uh, performance which i think is great yeah it's, it's actually really moving i watched it and i was like i teared I, up i kind of wish the scene was a little longer because yeah it really hit me it was really beautiful. yeah i forgot how it is quite short like she runs out um but it's a, it's a, i think it's the strongest scene in the movie because then it cuts to it does it's great because 
She does the poem, she cries, and she runs out of the room, and then it cuts to a close up of Heath Ledger's reaction. Yeah. And they were saving it. Like she was like it was so smart to let her read the poem without cutting back to Heath. It would have lost the impact. If they were just they just kept cutting back to Heath. Julia, Heath, Julia, Heath. It would have taken you out of the poem and taking your taking you out of her emotion. And then the smart move was to hold the camera on her, don't edit, finish the poem, and then finally show the reveal of him and the impact it had on his face. And so I thought that was by far the best directed moment of the movie. I like the poem too, and I, I love the the spoof in not another team movie. What, how's it go again? It's uh, ten things I I love about Janie Briggs. <laughs> I'm trying to find it right now online. I'm trying to find it. It's ridiculous stuff, yeah. And I remember there's one where it's like I I love to take pieces of Janie's hair, make little Janie Hair Briggs balls. hairballs. It's the guy who's obsessed with her. That's right. Yeah. Oh my god, little Janie Briggs oh, hairballs. I wanted, I'm trying to find the poem. Hold on, let me see if I, I'm just Googling it right now. I mean, it's, not another team movie did a great job spoofing it. I love when Janie talks. I love when Janie walks. I love when Janie, when Janie drinks. <laughs> Where's the rest of it? Oh, I love when Janie blinks. Here we go. I love it when Janie drinks. I love it when Janie blinks. I love, it when, I love it when Janie says hi. I love when Janie says, see you see in you English. <laughs> see you in English. <laughs> <laughs> I love following Janie to the mall and I love collecting strands of Janie's hair and rolling them up into little Janie hair balls. <laughs> Thank you, Ricky, <laughs> for that interesting poem. See you in English. See you in English. <laughs> oh my God, so funny. It's amazing. Uh, I-, I think this movie's great though. I-, I have a really good time and yeah, the first 25 minutes I think is just it's a little too out there, especially with Allison Chaney's character. Just it just makes no sense writing, because it has nothing to do with the plot. Yeah, writing smut in her room. Yeah, it's a little. It's weird, but it's it's odd. And I'm just watching like they are fucking taking shots in this movie. It, but it really gets going about halfway through for me. Like 30 minutes in ish, it really starts to take off. And once Verona's, it's really once Heath plot. Ledger comes. Yeah, into that's the what picture, I mean. Like yeah. once Verona's in the plot, yeah. involved in the plot, not just in the background, is like yeah. lighting stuff on fire. But once he's actually integral to the setup of what's going on. I think the movie really takes off. I agree. I agree. And I really enjoyed it. I, I liked the movie a lot. I gave it a four-star rating on Letterboxd. Whoa, yeah, four, four stars. stars. I'd probably give it a 3.5. So you hated it. I liked it a What's lot. What's wrong with you, man? It's a 7 out of 10, baby. For, for what it is, it does a great job in, in terms of like the teen romantic comedies. It's, it's certainly top tier, I think. Absolutely. Certainly is. Yeah. Certainly. Certainly. Certainly is. Surely is. is. You got anything else on this movie? Heath Ledger actually improvised that moment where he's playing with the fire in science club. It, it does. It's a great job. Like... Cut it, it cuts back to him and he's just like playing with it with his fingers and you're like, this guy is fucking badass. He's a cool guy. <laughs> he's a cool dude. <laughs> All right, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Hope you have some wonderful plans with your loved one. We hope you can see us live in Boston yeah, that'd in be April. Great. That'd be really cool. Be Tickets awesome are available guy. right now, April 18th at the Middle East Club. 7 p.m. doors open, so get those tickets ASAP before they sell out. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star reviews, please. Please leave the five-star reviews. On James will get a tattoo. 5,000 reviews now. We'll get a tattoo. Nice. <laughs> that's, that's of the, my choosing. It's a good rhyme. What is it? 5,000 reviews and I'll get a tattoo. And I'll get some tattoos. I'll get a tattoo. And I'll get six tattoos. One tattoo. Six tattoos. 5,000 Apple reviews. I'll get one tattoo. Easy. Easy peasy. All right, of cool. my choosing. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian Singleton, Tyler McFly, Andrew Hagen. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.